So let's do a quick little review here before we start the 5-2 notes. Um, if the function, and I'm going to write it a little more like a fraction, is sine of x over x. They want us to find the first derivative at pi over 6. Oh, I should have write that right. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the first derivative for a second. The first derivative of a fraction requires that we use the quotient rule. So it's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Now, if we put pi over 6 into that, we get pi over 6 times the cosine of pi over 6 minus the sine of pi over 6, all over pi over 6 squared. Now one of the reasons I wanted to do this problem is because I've seen this problem um, given on uh, some final exams in the past, and so it's just a, a good it's just a good thing that we should practice simplifying that. So now let's start with pi over 6. So pi over 6 is 30 degrees. The point on the unit circle is square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. So the cosine is square root of 3 over 2. The sine is 1 half. Now, um, you're never going to want to leave fractions within a fraction. So our denominators here are uh, 6, 2, and 36. And so uh, 6 times 2 uh, is 12. I'm sorry, 12, 2, and 36. And the least common multiple of that is 36. So do a little trick here. Multiply top and bottom each by 36. And when we do that, so this first fraction, we would divide we'd have 36 on the top and then divide by 12. So that would leave us with 3 pi squared of 3. And then 36 times a half is 18. And then the 36 is on the bottom. We're going to cancel just leaving us with pi squared. So that would be our answer for that. Just, you know, something a little different here. <coughs> Just so you kind of reminded yourself how to do that stuff. So next, let's start Lesson 4.2, the definite integral, part one. Now our objective here is to be able to understand where the definite integral uh, definition comes from and how to use Riemann sums to find that exact value. Um, and basically, we are searching for the areas under the curve. So let's get started. Let's say we have this curve here. This is the parabola y equals x squared from 0 to 1. And what we want to do is to use rectangles to estimate the area under the curve. Now let's for a moment think about, well, what if we first just kind of broke it into uh, four sections from 0 to 1? And now let's say we took the right ends, the heights here, and let's say that we form rectangles from that right end. So look what we did. There's the right end. We took that right end, we went over, we made a rectangle. Now you can see pretty clearly that we get a definite over uh, estimate 
it's too high. We got that that upper um, the piece that's going over this this piece here and here and here. Okay, so our estimate it isn't a great one, but but it is still an estimate of what's under that curve. Um, and if you have a concave up section, that right side rectangle will always be an overestimate. You just can't get around it because of the shape of the graph. But what if we kind of tried to change it up a little bit? Instead of making four rectangles, what if we made eight? And what if this time we went from the left side and over to make our rectangles? Well, we get an underestimate, but it seems a little bit closer than before. Here's our right side touching the curve and making a rectangle. And it's an overestimate. So you could think, well, maybe if we um, used the left endpoints and the right endpoints, and we could maybe even maybe average them to get a better estimate. Here is uh, with 10 the rectangles going from the left side. Here is 30 going from the left side. Here is 50. Now look how close 50 gets to approximating the area. Now each time, I don't know how well you can see it, you might be able to blow it up a little bigger in yours. <clears throat> this left side estimate is, is an area of 0 0.285, 0 0.3169, 0 0.3234. You might be able to notice that it's getting closer and closer to one third. So let's look at the actual definition. The definition says the area of the region S under the continuous function is the limit of the sum of the areas of the approximating rectangles. Now, if we can limit those or approach a number of rectangles approaching infinity, making them so uh, close to the real thing, we're going to actually get the actual area. If you use a sigma notation for that, you notice here we've got the sum up all of the rectangles. The areas are the function height times delta x, the, 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 the size of things. And you just are going to sum them all up. So the more rectangles we have, the more it becomes a closer estimate. So mathematicians thought, well, hey, why don't we, we know limits to infinity. Why don't we use that to help us? So the definition says, basically, Given a function that is continuous on an interval from A to B, when divided into n subintervals of equal width, delta x is that width, and from each interval choosing a point x sub i, then the definite integral of f of x from A to B is given by, this is your integral, is given by this notation. So what are we doing? We're taking the limit as x approaches infinity, as i equals 1 to n of f of x of i delta x. Now it's really important that we know what each of these things stand for. Okay. The f of x sub i is our height. What is x sub i? Well, this is either a left side rectangle or a right side rectangle, depending on the definition. <clears throat> and what is delta x? That is the width of the base. And that is found by doing 
b minus a over n. And I'm sorry here, change this. This should be n to infinity. So the main thing that you want to realize, and it's so important, just like we know that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line at a point on the curve, we need to know that the definite integral is the area under the curve. That's super important. What we think of is the definite integral area. The definite that did, let me start over. <laughs> A definite integral is the net area under the curve. So areas above the x-axis become a positive area, and areas below the x-axis become a negative. So technically, what we can think of is, is if this is area one, and this is area two, and this is area three the integral from a to b of our function is going to be the net area from a to b. So it's going to be area 1 minus area 2 plus area 3. There are some rules that are going to help us deal with these limits. If we sum an n number of constants, this sum is just going to be c times n. So a constant gives us a constant times n. If we are um, summing i when i goes from 1 to n. So let's let's think about that list. That's that's going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to n. So if we are summing, that's that's exactly what this is saying. Uh, if we're summing them, you can use a formula. It's just n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Now, let's say we are adding the sum of all the squares. So that's going to be like 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared all the way up to n squared. If you add up those, it uses a slightly different formula. n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. There's even a formula for the cubes, if you want to add the list of cubes. So let's think about that for a minute. <clears throat> that would be 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed all the way up to n cubed. You're going to use the formula, the quantity of n times n plus 1 over 2, all squared. Kind of neat. So those formulas are going to be very helpful to us. Uh, the fifth formula here just tells us that don't worry about a constant. You can take that constant and remove it and take it to the outside and multiply it by the final answer. Step or uh, formula six just says if we have two things added together, we can separate the sums. And seven, it says if we have Sorry, the numbers are all out of whack here. This is five. Let me see. One seven. Um, it just says basically that if you're subtracting two things, you can just subtract the two sums. So those formulas are going to be very helpful to what we're going to accomplish. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, use the formulas we just saw to determine the value of this big sum. So we're going to sum, uh, the i's are going to start at 1 and go all the way up to 100, and we're going to add those together. 
Well, the first thing I would do, because we don't want to plug it, plug in one, get a number, then plug in two, then get a number, and then plug in three, and then get a number, and plug in four, and get a number, because that's going to be a big, long list. But what I can think about is what is 3 minus 2i squared? Well, if you actually FOIL that, you're going to get 9 minus 12i plus 4i squared. And then if we separate it using the rules from the last page, very similar to our um, limit rules, that's the constant 9 minus 12 times the rule for i plus 4 times the rule for i. Now, uh, the rule is for a constant like this one. If you look back at the page we saw before, this is a constant rule. So it is just the constant times n. Well, what's our n? In this case, our n's are all 100. Sometimes you just leave n, n. In this case, our n is 100. <laughs> Let me make that look nice. Okay. And then it's going to be 12 times the rule for an i. Well, the i rule is, I'll write it over here to the side, then I can erase it, n times n plus 1 over 2. Well, what's our n? Our n this time is 100. So that's 100 times 101 divided by 2. Wait a second. And then we're going to do 4 times the rule for i squared. Our i squared rule is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. So if we plug in an n of 100, that's going to be 100 times 1 and 1 times 2 times 100 is 200, plus 1 is 201, divided by 6. Now remember, we're summing up integers, 1, 2, 3, you know, and their squares and all that stuff. So you should get an integer value when it's all said and done. If you didn't, something's wrong. So that's 900. This parenthesis gives us... Um, Um, I'm sorry, what does it give us? Uh, and then this back piece. Oh, let's see. Now you could reduce the, the 4 and the 6, make that 2 and 3. Uh, 201 is divisible by 3. <clears throat> 201 divisible by 3 is, what is that? Let's see. 60 67. 67. So then that's going to be 2 times 100 times 101 times 67. So then you get 900 minus 60,600 60, plus 100, wait, what is that? 1,353,400 gives me a final answer of 1,293,700. So adding up that big long list when I plug in 1 and when I plug in 2 and I plug in 3, if I did it by hand, which no one would want to do, but if I plugged in those 100 numbers and then added them up, I would get an answer of 1,293,700. Kind of interesting, right? Now that we've practiced using the formula, I would like to actually do an interval. So, we're going to use the definition to find the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared. So, 
How do we write that? Well, that is the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx. What does that really mean? Well, that's the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from 1 to n of all of the rectangles f of x sub i delta x. Now, before you go um, any further, we're going to have to find x sub i and delta x. Well, first thing I always find is delta x. Delta x, remember, is b minus a over n. And in this case, our a is 0, because we're starting at 0. Our b is 1, so that's 1 minus 0 over n, or 1 over n. Okay? So that's what's going to go right there. That is 1 over n. Next thing you want to find is x sub i. What is x sub i? Well, x sub i is a plus i times delta x. That's why you have to do delta x first. Well, um, a is 0. i times delta x 1 over n is i over n. So now, that is going to go, now this is, be very careful with this, that is going to go into our function. Okay? That's our input into our function. Okay, so we're going to do the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of our function plugging in i over n times 1 over n. Okay, so that's just the initial setup. Now let's plug this into our function. That's the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of dun, 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 uh, i over n going into our function squares it. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of i squared over n cubed. Now, the only variable in this is i. That's the only thing you look at to determine which of those formulas from a few pages back we're going to use. We're going to use the i squared formula. What is this? That is a constant. It, it, you'll see right there. It's just a number. So I am going to rewrite this. I'm going to, we're not doing the limit yet. We'll get to that. We're going to pull out the 1 over n cubed in front of the sum of 1 uh, to n of i squared. Okay. Now, this is just a formula from the other pages. Okay. So let's actually apply the formula. So the 1 over n cubed is just a formula, or I'm sorry, a constant out front. So the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n cubed times the answer that you see of whatever that formula is highlighted in blue. Well, the formula for i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Now, finally, we can take the limit to infinity of that. Now, remember our limits to infinity. Limits to infinity are the end behavior, the, the um, horizontal asymptotes on the right end. So we're thinking plugging in positive numbers. On top, we have n, n, and 2n. So we have technically on top our lead term is 2n cubed. And that is a cube, I'm sorry, that looks like this. On the bottom, our lead term 
is six n cubed. Now, many times when you get to this point and you're doing the limits to infinity, you're doing the uh, horizontal asymptote rules, however you want to think about it, um, usually when you get to this point, the lead term on top usually matches the lead term on the bottom. And so then our area is 2 over 6 or 1 third. Now we saw in those um, examples where we were estimating those uh, rectangles that we were getting a number closer and closer and closer to 0.3 repeating. And because the exact area under the curve from 0 to 1 of x squared is 1 third. Kind of neat, right? Let's practice another one. Sorry, my iPad's acting up a little bit. Let's find that page and keep going. There it is. Okay. Now, it says, using the definition of the definite integral, let's do the same exact thing to compute the area from 0 to 2 of x squared plus 1. Okay. So, remember, let's set it up. This is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i delta x. So remember, the first thing you want to compute is what is our delta x. Well, our a is 0. Remember, delta x is b minus a over n. Our a is 0, our b is 2, and n is just n. So we get a delta x of 2 over n. The next thing we're going to calculate is our x sub i. Our x sub i is a plus i times delta x. So our a is 0, our i is i, our delta x is 2n, so we just get 0 plus 2 over n i, which is what you see right there. Now, once we have done that, so you'll see that's just the summation we see right here. Um, now we are going to plug that in. Okay, so, so let's think about what that is. So that's the sum going from 1 to n of f of 2i over n times 2 over n. Okay. And so we're going to plug that 2i over n into our function. And this is what you get when you put, well, that's telling us what to do. It's just what we see. Okay. So if we plug that into our function, we're going to get 2i over n squared plus 1 times 2 over n. Now, we have to distribute the 2 over n into this. So we get Two i over n squared is four i squared over n squared times the two n, because this two n is going to distribute to both. We're going to get four times two is eight i squared over n cubed plus two over n. Now remember, this and that those are constants. They're just going to come along for the ride. This whole thing is a constant. So the things in yellow act like constants act. So 
you notice I keep writing this crap <laughs> stuff stuff for a long long time okay. here I'm gonna think of this as 8 over n cubed times i squared and this one I'm gonna think of as my rules of what do I do for a constant. Okay. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so, trying to move it, it doesn't want to, let's see. So, here, let's delete that. Um, this uses my I squared formula. This one uses my constant formula. Sorry, my Siri is uh, acting silly. It's not helping me. Let's try again. <laughs> okay, where are we at here? So, uh, Let's see if it's my Apple Pencil case here, but anyway. So my limit as n goes to infinity of this first piece um, ended up being 8 over n cubed times my I squared formula, which is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And this back one, that's just um, the constant times um, n. And so that's just 2 over n times n. Um, let's simplify that down. And then we can finally do the limit to infinity. And so um, this piece on top here for this first fraction. The 8 and the 6 can become 4 thirds. Um, the limit as n approaches infinity of this piece, we're going to use the lead term on this top, ends up being 8 um, n to the third. The bottom's lead term is 3n to the third. So this first piece becomes 4 thirds. And the back piece doesn't have an n in it at all. And so the limit to infinity of that is just the constant 2. And so 4 thirds plus 2, which is 6 thirds, ends up being, oh, I'm so sorry. Remember I said this was 8? I didn't write 8 then. See how I got 8? Let me go back. We got a 4 and a 2, that's an 8, I'm sorry. Um, so it's 8 thirds plus 4, which is 6 thirds. 8 thirds plus 6 thirds is 14 thirds, is the area under the curve. So that is that one. Now, <coughs> remember, an integral is an area under the curve. So if you draw it, and you get something that you know how to calculate its area based upon the formulas for area, feel free to do that. And so that's what we're going to see in these examples. So if we interpret the integral, we can just use our area formulas. So the first one is, if we draw it, a quarter circle from 0 to 1. Um, it's the upper part of the circle if you use the positive square root of 1 minus x squared. It is a uh, the bottom part of the circle if you use a negative in front of that. 
And so this is just the area of a quarter circle, which is one fourth pi r squared. And our radius in this circle is one. And so we can just use our formulas for circles. So it's pi over four is the area under that curve. So the integral from zero to one is just the area from zero to one of that curve. So it's perfect. If we were to draw the graph from zero to three of x minus one. Now remember, that's just y equals x minus one. That's just a line. What do we get? Well, it has a y-intercept of negative one and a slope of one, so it goes up one over one, up one over one, and so on. So it's not exactly even, but you know what it is. There we go. Um, what we can do is we can use rules of area. Area um, goes from um, 0 to 3. Remember this bottom area, we'll call area 2, is going to be negative, and this area is going to be positive. How do you find the area of a triangle? Well, it's 1 half base times height. So area 2 is going to be 1 half, a uh, base of 1, and a height of 1. Area 1 is going to be a base, 1 half, base of 2, height of 2. And so this is just going to be the integral from 0 to 3. Is just going to be area 1 minus area 2, or 1 and a half. And you could put square units if you wanted. So if you can calculate the area the old school way, you can calculate integrals using those formulas, which is nice. And remember this new book, this is lesson 4.2. And we're going to do 1, 5, 21, and 25. There's lots of steps, you know, because they're so long, I only wanted you to try a few of them. Okay, thank you.